there's a unique feeling of nakedness when you lose the most important men in your life that way. So for me, that was my father and my brother, you know, so my dad taught me how to stand on my own two feet and, you know, be resourceful and be independent as well, just to make sure that his baby girl was going to be okay. Troy, love him to death. I was like, but that was my little brother, you know? So I have feelings of, I let him down somehow. Like you go through this litany of emotions and like, I still have it. I still say like, when I, when I get up there, the way I am going to drag that kid, like <laughs> I'm, so, oh, he has it coming. Hey everyone. Let's start healing. I'm Adrian Murchison and welcome back to part two of my conversation with Megan Harris. We have more in common than we think and what we have in common can change the world. And as you know, if you listen to part one of my conversation with Megan Harris, she is running for a local political office in Fulton County. She is running to serve on the Fulton County Board of Commissioners at a District 2 seat. She's running against a uh, longtime incumbent, Bob Ellis, who I invited to be on the, the podcast. I, I actually invited him to an, a phone interview with me for a supporter report. And I also plan to ask him to be on the podcast because I understand that he is a very spiritual person as well. And I was looking forward to an opportunity to talk with him. But we have Megan today in part two of our conversation where she goes even more deeply into um, her experience in the loss of her brother and uh, family issues that I know so many of us can relate to when it comes to uh, caregiving of our family members and re just responsibilities shift as we grow older. So without further ado, let's get back to Megan. Let's meet her and let's start healing. You were saying that he took he took yes. that away from you. Yeah, he, he took that foresight. So that foresight of uh, or a title away from me. So I wouldn't hone in and try to overanalyze it. Um, great example. Walking into this right before I would I went to qualify for this race here. Um, in all pragmatic sense, it did not make sense for me to jump in to the race. Um there was not a long runway. I had a lot of life that happened right beforehand. That was the dust still had not settled. Um, I lost my brother last summer, unfortunately, to suicide. And that displaced my mom from Florida. And so she was moving here. We were just wrapping up. She had just closed on her house in December. And um, that was that was a very rough period of time. It still is, to be honest. Um, that uh, my there was a house fire last November at my dad's house in the city of South Fulton. Um, excuse me, where it was a, the house was a total loss. Uh, we're just now getting to a point to demo to demolition and dealing with the I was dealing with the insurance company. So there was a lot of heavy stuff happening, and it just and I had not been like working that up. And I had been I had not talked directly to the Democrat local Democratic Party. Um, or anything like so all that buildup that, you know, would make sense. Right. If you're planning on uh, getting into a race, um, those things, it didn't match. So when we prayed about it, because it kept coming up in different ways um, and my mom and I would look at each other and then we finally prayed about it and she was like, do it. And I did. So but if I had been left by myself and not had a prayer warrior with me and, and just been in my own head about it. I'm, I made a, I, I would have found myself fighting with myself. Like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a planner. That's what I do. <laughs> so it, that is such an oxymoron to, to do something like this without a plan of action that way. 
outside of following the passion and knowing that you're in the right space. So when I say he took that from me, he took that so I wouldn't be playing up here and wasting wasting time waste, uh, and not paying attention to his lead versus me dig kicking a nugget and then overanalyzing it and be like, okay, I'll, I'll start this then. So that's when you hear me say God's plot twist <laughs> because, you know, once you do that work on yourself and I have been doing work on myself for years, you know, with increased my meditation, reading, reading my Bible. Um, so as you're doing that to be a better person, a better Christian, the, the consequence of that is that you can't turn around and run backwards. You can't act like you don't know. And so that is where, like, I was like, okay, like I knew, I, I knew better. Um, like how, how, how like a kid knows better with their parents. Uh, I knew better. So I was like, okay, let me just hush. Obviously you're the leader and let's go lead me. And I just I loosened my grip and I allowed him to lead me. So um, without having, you know, with uh, that piece. So that's, that's the explanation around that. And everyone's path is different with that. Some people, you know, he'll gift maybe certain visions to, so, to people and so on and so forth, or he'll do it to people around you. Other people will see it. You may not, but other, but he's making you practice listening to and hearing from other folks. So it's a grooming process. There's always, he's such a loving father that he will do that for us. It won't be abrasive. It's not going to be loud and bellowing in your face. Like that's not how it's going to come across. It's going to be like conversational low, maybe even a whisper. Sometimes it may come from someone totally unexpected, just in passing, but it's is just as heavy and meaty and um, fruitful as food is food for you. Right. And uh, when you say, are, are you saying this is so beautiful what you're sharing and thank you so much for sharing this. And are you saying that one, the path that you're on is a calling and everything that you have gone through, uh, which is really a lot of trauma. Those events are traumatic yeah. and everything that you've gone through, uh, you're also growing within and you can't, you knew that because of your calling, you, you can't, you couldn't just be still or shut down or run away because you knew that there's a divine calling for you to be on a certain journey for yourself, regardless of the outcome. Right. And the miracle is in the testimony, right? So that you will have the great works done. You'll go through a tough time. But sometimes what people do is like letting go at step, on step three out of four. Um, that last step is testifying. That's, that's the point. Um, we're supposed to share these experiences with other folks and they and they can be shared when it hits you to share. You just need to obey because they can be shared at a, right at the moment when someone else needs to hear it and vice versa. You know, that'll happen on your side receiving. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 a journey. And sometimes it can be birthed through trauma. And maybe that's that's just how your trials and tribulations is it's that testing. It's 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 forcing you to shed the outgrown armor because yeah. now you've graduated to a new level. And I think that's something that's very key for us to remember, um, whether you're spiritual, religious, just as a Christian, is that new levels mean new armor. There's a new devil. Mm, that's so, deep. And as you go forward, it's not necessarily as physical. It's going to be spiritual, emotional, psychological, that you have to deal that you're that's going to be in the room with you. And that takes a different kind of discipline that takes a different kind of practice and in your faith. And it's not as flippant like, oh, OK, I'll just do this. No, this is this is now you said that you, you you've bought into this. This is a lifestyle. We have letters that in our in our Bible that talk about it. So John means John. Yeah, John, like. He told us, he's like, hey, congratulations, you guys drank the Kool-Aid, you're in the club, heads up, it's going to be hard. <laughs> like, nothing was, pro nothing with comfort was promised 
for us until the ultimate, you know, until we get to the, until we're upstairs with him at home. We know that promise that that's the covenant that's here. But while we're here on earth, that is not promised to us. We, it was shared with us that we will go through tough times, but we will also experience some glories as well. And it's going to look so different from everybody's life. Um, but at the end of the day, we're supposed to all be able to help each other and learn something from each other. So we're, we're woven in, we're really woven in. Um, and that's the, I, I take that as one of the key takeaways. I love what you're saying right now. Uh, it speaks so much to, I, I so believe what you're, what you're sharing because what I have found, and when you say, uh, the more you grow, I don't know if this was your, these were your exact words, but you, the, the more you learn, the more we grow spiritually, we're taken to another level. And so then there's more that comes with that, that requires us to grow more. And that is just, so sometimes when I think about the truth of that, I think about someone who maybe is, uh, I don't know, late 60s, 70, 80, you know, in those, in those years, and maybe they haven't done that. And then maybe they think about doing it, or maybe somebody suggests they do it, or I don't know, somehow it's brought up. Well, that's hard. You know, you've lived your whole life a certain way. Right. And then all of a sudden, maybe you're going to start now trying to be conscious <laughs> you know, and, you know, be, be connected to the, the idea that there's something greater than you, that is pretty hard. And the concept that, oh, maybe I haven't been doing it right for 80 years right. is, uh, that is so daunting. That's so daunting. Uh, when I think about it, because, you know, I think about like, God, I, I conquered this, you know, and I've healed in this area. And then there's, something else is going to come up that is going to require healing. So it's, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it, 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 it is. And it's okay to say it. it, it it's, it's a lot that happens with that, but it can, you can be that six year old and turn around yes. my good friend, Susan, who was uh, my mom's neighbor. And we ended up being like besties. Um, she passed away earlier this year. She was 92, but she was one of my best friends. It's, she didn't get saved until her late sixties. And then she was like, the most powerful prayer warrior I've ever met after that. Like I almost caught, I was like, you're a witch. Cause so what she would pray for will just like happen, you, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so, but it was, it, it can, it can absolutely happen. And we're not built to all of a sudden just plateau. We're not, that's not how he created us. We're going to continue to learn and evolve. You, we don't all of a sudden just, okay, some, we all of a sudden learn the sum of everything and that's it. Like how boring would that be? That doesn't even make sense. Um, so yeah, no, it's, and sometimes I will, I'll, I'm okay to say this out loud too, with your design. And I went through this too. It's like, sometimes it sucks to be strong, not to curse your design, but sometimes you have those moments where you're like, it sucks to be strong because you can bear some weight, but it still hurts. <laughs> you still get beat up. You're still like, I don't want to, you know, and, you know, just be over there like a, like a mad child and next sitting next to your parent. And you're like, man, I, don't, I, I love you, but I don't like you right now. It's okay to operate in the, and have those moments. That's, that is completely natural. Don't fight it. Go ahead and work through it because it, that's, that's just our, that is our flesh. And there's some tough stuff and people have gone through some really serious traumas out here and been able to, like turn around and blossom and they may not even know how they got there and that's okay. The thing is that they are there and they're thriving and they're like, Hey, he never Absolutely. left. Me. Absolutely. And I want to say, I'm, I'm so sorry for the loss of your brother. And I, I've lost two brothers and something that um, struck me that a, another friend brought up because she had lost a brother herself was that losing a sibling, you still have both of your parents, thank goodness. Well, and, I have my mom. I lost my dad in 2017. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so, okay. So this speaks to the, the point I'm trying to get to is that 
a lot of people know the pain of losing a parent or um, unfortunately the pain of losing a child. And, but losing a sibling is not something that is often discussed in terms of the pain of that kind of, of a loss. And I remember when my first brother passed, I literally was beside him and said, I don't know who I am because I was used to having two brothers and, you know, I had this balance between each of them. One was emotional, one was more logical. And so it was disorienting. Yes. It was, it was disorienting. And I, I had, at, I had lost both my parents at that point, but with this first brother who passed, I went through all the stages of grief after and including the rage, you know? And so it's, um, I, I just wanted to ask you about, um, how you're doing and how you're experiencing that loss. And you mentioned that he was two years younger than you. Yes. So he was two and a half years younger. So, um, no, I, I appreciate that you you listed off those different emotions because I share those too. And the rage piece is something we don't talk about enough. Like just the, um, so Troy, he unfortunately took his life back last July. And that is still very tough. It's still very tough. And then there's a unique feeling of nakedness when you lose the most important men in your life that way. So for me, that was my father and my brother, you know, so my dad taught me how to stand on my own two feet and, you know, be resourceful and be independent as well, just to make sure that his baby girl was going to be okay. Troy, love him to death. I was like, but that was my little brother, you know? So I have feelings of, I let him down somehow. Like you go through this litany of emotions and like, I still have it I still say like when I when I get up there, the way I am going to drag that kid, like <laughs> I'm, so, oh, he has it coming. Um, so I, you know, I keep I try to keep the humor with that too, but I miss him terribly. I'm sure but, uh, it does speak to an important platform piece too, as far as mental health, mental health with our men, um, and providing safe spaces and acknowledging the lack thereof that we have for our men. Interestingly enough, before Troy passed last um, February, earlier in the year, last February, I had done a presentation where I had taken some of the CDC data and uh, was talking about how the suicide rates had quadrupled with American men. Uh, And uh, since the pandemic, you know, taking all that data in stride. And that was completely devastating. It's yeah. devastating because what happens, and some of this is Troy's Troy story, is that they look at their age, they look at where they are, and they're like, I don't fit in to where society says I'm supposed to be right now. That pressure that we put on them. Um, and they're already built to be providers. They're very sp- specifically designed, right? But we still have to take care of them. We still have to acknowledge that they have emotions too. They, they, when they experience failures is going, you know, as far as like supporting their family or themselves or their own image that, that, I mean, those, those are very real and very hard conversations and emotions for them too. And um, that's something I definitely want to continue to invest time, energy, and creating these spaces, these safe spaces for our young boys and our young men. We are seeing the symptomology of that as a culture, American culture, with our boys out here in these streets. They are looking, yeah. they're lost. They're looking for something. They're, they're, their sense of belonging is off. You know, they're not tethered to anything. And and they don't know how to cope with it. So, you know, you'll see this, you'll see them act out in different ways. And um, we did, we need to focus in and hone back in on taking care of our own and taking care of our, our men. 
um, especially our veteran. And that goes to our veteran men and women. That's that's a whole nother layer to this, too. We have a lot of men and women that serve and then they come back home and they feel lost. A lot of them end up being grossly underemployed when they come back because just something as simple as their MOS in the military and what that title looks like in the private sector out here they don't know what it even looks like. And then vice versa, these small and mid-sized business owners, they're like, okay, I have a need for an ops person, but they don't understand how these MOSs can be a great fit for them. So I'm grateful for institutions like Home Depot and Lowe's because they're, they're advocates for veterans. They'll hire them on. Um, but at the same token, if your MOS called you, you were basically diplomatic affairs but then when you come home, the only thing you can see, you can find is stocking shelves. There's something yeah. off about that. That plays on you, you of know, because it's like, what do I do with that? And I, you know, I serve this great country. So that that is some that is a conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a conversation and then action items from there that the community as a whole needs to have. Yeah. And it seems as if that has been the case since the Vietnam War or before. Right. And what is the acronym MOS? Um, let's see, what is this? It's, I have to look, Aisha, look up MOS, military MOS acronym. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that is their the equivalent to like their job title, military occupational specialty. My brain kept going to modify it. I was like, it's not modified, Megan. Military operational specialty. Okay. Uh, so in, in, along the lines of this, um, mental health, there is a, uh, a, a big problem with Fulton County jails yes. and what, how do you feel about that? What do you think can be done? I mean, there have been, there have been deaths, uh, suicide, uh, the conditions are said to be horrific, uh, and, and. Obviously, that that is a big impact on mental health. Absolutely. So as far as the jail is concerned, that is a absolutely special topic of discussion because it hinges off our relationships. So taking one step back, what a commissioner does, we are the purse strings that for a lot of the functional for the functional services within the county that does include public safety and extends to our constitutional officers as well, which is we are DA, our judges, court of clerks, and um, the sheriff's office as well. So with that, we have to work collaboratively with these other departments and these other leaders so that we can produce a solution that doesn't yield people dying in our jail. We do have it, we do need to rebuild our jail. That's inevitable, that is inevitable. However, it doesn't make sense to Produce, give you a brand new jail without fixing the the problems, that pathway going there to it. Otherwise, we're going to end up right in the same position. For example, the jail that we currently have now that was built in the early 2000s, it's never since the time it opened its doors has been operating at the that at the their standard population level. It's always been over. So it's already accelerated the depreciation of the infrastructure in and of itself. Just 20 plus years now of just being overpopulated on top of it. Um, working with judges, uh, with diversion programs, clearing up backlogs, looking at, looking at opportunities to leverage technology to help clear up backlogs as well, making sure that they have the appropriate amount of funding for their staff. Um, and that we're, we're doing everything possible to keep safety at the forefront, not only for those folks who happen to be in jail, but those also our guards um, and the sheriffs and the sheriff's uh, and staff as well. And any support staff that that's a part of that process, too, because everyone's safety needs to be at top of mind. Uh, jail is different than going to prison because jail, you can just simply be too broke to bond out and be completely innocent. We have to keep that in mind. Anybody can land there. Um, you know, you can end up get pulled over for broken tail light and it can escalate to you going to jail. <laughs> that's how that's how exactly. like that. And I think that's important to remember because it feels like, oh, I haven't done any major crime. We think major crime, you can have 
a warrant just for not showing up to traffic court and that will can uh, constitute you going to jail to that to that same facility so i think the coaching for the public to still have a sit have some sensitive uh have some softness in this area and uh to uh, humane approach in this area is something that is also equally important to remember that this is not prison these men and women have not been formally convicted they can just be too poor to bond out and they are in a death trap and that's unacceptable and i think that's that's the word that we need to lead with it's unacceptable to have people in these kind of conditions at any time and it is our it is our burden to bear to make sure that we are doing everything within our power to make sure that people are not sitting there unnecessarily, that we are coming up with creative solutions that actually strike, that make an impact to the root cause um, so that we can reduce recidivism and, you know, have, you know, still have a proper correctional rehabilitative approach in this, in, in the, our justice system. And let's say for the sake of, of the conversation that all of the commissioners are, uh, feel the way that you do. And this is, uh, you know, the, the conditions are unacceptable. Things have to improve that all of them are on this. Everyone's on the same page. Um, do you have ideas about what could be done to improve these conditions? Yes. So, one of the one of the first things is looking at that budget for that goes towards our Fulton County Correctional Facility um, and strengthening the relationship with the sheriff's department. So strengthening our relationship with Labatt that has been strained. It has made it to national news. So it's not a secret, but working is going to be a concerted effort on constantly working with the sheriff's office, our judges and our quarter clerks for to support them with as with modernization of their technologies that they're using, right? Um, and making sure that they feel heard and supported as well. Looking at what their what their needs are with the you know with the with with an honest vision, with an honest vision, not just you know, not just not just coming up with some fluff, not just okay, saying the highlight items because they sound good, but really having an invested conversation with these individuals and supporting them. And with it, and also communicating what we are able to do within, you know, with the budget that we have at the time, because we get our budget from tax dollars, right? And when we're talking about tax dollars, the next thing we talk about community is reducing taxes. So when we talk about all of that lives in the same ecosystem and Unfortunately, we because we don't do a good job within our high school curricula, right, of communicating how local government works and, and our tax dollars and so on and so forth. Civics is still just like half a credit. So joke, you know, we don't take it seriously. We're not groomed to think that way unless you you're attached to it in another way with your family or your political like that kind of those kind of niche moments like the most of us out here are like, fix it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand why it's so hard, but we're not connecting those dots to see because when we're talking about preaching, reducing taxes, that's going to be, that's taking the bed sheet and you're pulling it from another corner. Um, and the, our job is, our professional job is to come in and make sure we're doing the due diligence and the feasibility studies and so on and so forth to make sure that if it does, if something does fall short, how are we mitigating the impact as much as possible or if it makes sense to cut something, you know, so that, that's what we're, that's what we are serving as, as a public servant as well. We're doing that heavy lifting piece in the uh, behind the scenes to make sure that we are the, the solutions being implemented. Um, but that education on the front for everybody is absolutely crucial. So we can be on the same page when we are making movements around that. But I would say it's, 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 it's going to start with coming to the table with a with a genuine spirit of collaborative uh, a collaboration to start writing this ship because it's going to be it's going to take some time. It's going to be like doing a U-turn in a battleship and that's OK. It's OK. We're here for it. We're 10 toes in, but we got to start the process because this back and forth and us on the national news is a hot mess. <laughs> OK, it, it, I, 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 it's a hot mess. <laughs> What is the, uh, what is, 
the big theme that you hear or something essential that you're hearing from uh, residents as you're knocking on doors and talking to people? As it pertains to the jail or just in general? In general. Sure. So um, it, up here, I've heard we've taught, had conversations around career services. So that in the, in the, um, the light of, yes, of course, helping our youth. Uh, one of the things I'm a huge proponent of is bringing pre-apprenticeship opportunities um, and to help groom our youth with um, opportunities with um, everything from sheet metal, robotics, AI, education as well, because we got to fortify them to be out here in this global financial, this global market. Um, when we walk out of our doors now, everything's global you have anything in your office, turn it over. Is it from the, you know, like everything's from all over the world. Uh, so that's how we have to think. We have to train our minds to think that we are in a global competition. Um, and then also for our working populations, I've identified a segment that's about the ages between 45 and 55 that have experienced a layoff. We hear about these layoffs on the news all the time, and they're not small. We're talking about thousands of jobs being cut at a given time. All right. So that happens to you. You get your severance. You're like, OK, you try to stay competitive in the market. The next thing you start noticing that same job title that you have slash AI. What do I do next? Do I need to go back to school? Do I need to you know, invest in a certification? That is an opportunity for county services to come in to bring in some professionals. A uh, great example of that, we actually were able to do uh, do a partnership with Emory University and bringing one of their experts to the uh, to North Springs High School and had the, had it open to the community to do a deep dive in on chat GPT. Who showed up? Parents showed up, students showed up, business owners showed up because they're tra all trying to figure out how to stay competitive in this market and using these really cool tools instead of having these cool tools run all over you. And um, so that is that is an opportunity and a solution that we can provide. So opportunities for free education and also deeply discounted certification processes and so on and so forth. So when I talk about collaboration, that goes underneath that umbrella as well. And purposeful vision, those go underneath those umbrellas right there as far as solutions for the community, fortifying them to stay competitive, encouraging small businesses to stay competitive in the market so that we have these mom and pops that continue to persist. And that really is the lifeblood of a community. Yeah. And I just have two more questions that I want to ask you. And you went to the um, Democratic Convention, didn't you? Yes. It was yeah. so exciting. <laughs> it was yeah, electric. I just, yeah, I just wanted you to describe that, that, experience and what did you do there was it to attend were you were you engaged in an activity what what was it like okay so uh first off chicago is beautiful that was my first time going to chicago as well and seeing this the architecture and the river going through i was like gasp um, so my participation there, you had a lot of things going on. You had not only had the convention, you also had caucuses and councils that were meeting at McCormick Place. That's predominantly where I spent a lot of time to networking with people, educating myself on some of the new things that were happening in D.C., some of the, how conversations have been trending. Um, what, one of them being with talking about rent. You know, rent in our country is gotten out of control. And I was really excited to hear that this was a main topic of conversation with our our national legislators. And because it's important, we that's that fuel, fuels our homeless community too. Um, talking to our within the women's caucus about women's rights, our reproductive rights, what that can lead to with with those kind of impacts to each one of our states and our board, you know, our, our right to choose uh, as well. So that was very exciting. They, I also got a chance to see that they, how they support local commerce and they had the whole vendors area and it wasn't just only pigeonholed and just politics. Uh, it kind of, it branched out into, you know, to market some of the local businesses there too. And it was just super exciting. The people I got a chance to meet, I got a chance to meet some the attorney generals of Illinois, New York, and 
I believe also Missouri uh, up there as well. So that was ex that was just extremely exciting. Just kind of being there, feeling the electricity, going to Soldiers Field because that's where they had to run off of the rest of us because it got packed in there. It was a lot of people, <laughs> but just being there on the field, the big screens, and then seeing that artists come out like Common. Um, I'm a fan of him too. So it was it was just a whole wrap of just excitement. And um, I was really proud to be there. I was really grateful that we were able to pull it off to be there. Uh, I went with my campaign manager and my mother, and it worked out where we could stay at a friend of mine's house. So we were meant to be there. It was great. <laughs> An experience of a lifetime for some people. That yes, it was history. <laughs> it, was, it was. So is there a time going back to spirituality for a moment as we close out is there a time when you experienced a miracle or a blessing that you you can share you're willing to share and you said uh this was all god this had nothing to do with me it was completely beyond your control or doing yeah like me standing here, <laughs> being here has been a huge, it is a miracle in and of itself. Cause I, that was, that was pretty low. Like just the succession of events, the last seven years of my life have been very busy since um, my dad had passed away in 2017. And then that wow. put us uh, in probate court for almost four years. And uh, he did have a will. We had family that contested it. And so I, I actually was able to put together a presentation from that, which is hugely informative and for uh, important for folks to understand like estate planning and just to help guard yourself with that, because that'll yank you out. That'll yank you out of your spirituality real quick, going through a probate process. And that's something that, you know, we should definitely talk about more often as well. Um, but from there, fast forward, it was really tough kind of supporting. We were supporting his estate while I'm over here taking care of my mortgage, so that's two mortgages. So when people say they're supporting a state, that's really just as a fancy way of saying you're paying the bills to keep the <laughs> and family. You can see how families lose inheritances and lose wealth. Yeah. Going through that process if you're not prepared. Because um, it's so costly. Yeah, it's very costly. Um, you you do need to onboard a lawyer, uh, trying to navigate it yourself. I'm 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 pretty I would say I'm I'm decently smart, but you know, even then reading legal lease, okay, those legal docs that end the petitions and knowing which one to file and all of that, it, it, it's overwhelming because that's happening in the midst of your grief. Um, and then we had the pandemic happen and I, I switched firms. I went and went ahead and went independent professionally. And that was, that was a task because it I had a non-compete. I couldn't reach out to my clients and which was, uh, you know, that was extremely tough and having other people try to call and poach them. And then we get on the other side of the pandemic and we had we had that um, our Juneteenth thing. We had our second round. It was the second round of Juneteenth. And that very next month is when I lost my brother. And then after that, like I remember after that, I got I got rock, got my car broken into just going on, <laughs> going to the movies. And then a month after that. Uh, that's when the house burned down. So it's it was like this rapid succession of trauma, like big trauma events. And I felt pretty low. Like I was, and then my mom was displaced trying to help her and we cope differently. She like, we don't cry at the same time. She's like, why aren't you crying? I was like, I did it this morning. It's fine. And like, <laughs> you know, like it, 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 you, it was just so many things that I cannot imagine where I would be if I didn't have God. Like, that's how I know he exists. Cause I was not walking. Like I, I, I had, I was like, I just, I want to sit here and give up. Yeah. You know, yeah. those were very real feelings. Um, but the beauty of that is like, hey, and there's, and I'm not going to lie to anybody. Like there's still moments that you can have off days. And when those things happen, give yourself the grace and go ahead and see if, if you have the capacity, give yourself the grace to give yourself, you know, a, a day, a half day, or right when you clock out of work, just 
you know, do something for yourself, sit still somewhere or something. So, cause it's not going to stop. I don't want to ever elude just because of that. It's going to stop. Right. This is a good remembrance though, of why you're able to continue to wake up that next morning right. uh, and pull yourself, even if you have to count down. Cause there's mornings I had to count down just to get out of bed, like mm -hmm. pumping myself up and yeah. like, hey, we can do it. And like, you know, get up and you just hurry up and pop up, you know, so you don't yeah. see so your bed doesn't swallow you. I, I would say my bed, like my house would try to kidnap me. <laughs> so uh, and those are and those are natural and those are OK to talk about. But having having God in my life, but also godly friends uh, in my life makes a huge difference because when you have surround yourself and that's the other part, you have to surround yourself with your folks. Yeah. Surround yourself with people who are just as spiritual and they believe in, in that higher power, too, because they'll come through for you. They can sit and share in those moments with you. You can have those open venting conversations and someone not persecute you or say, oh, you're not really a believer. No, it's like, yeah, no, I, ha I hate being strong. It's like, I know. Right. But we know he got us, you know, like, you know, you, someone you can be in your skin with and still love God. Absolutely. That's 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 the miracle. Like and doing all that work and that that's how it shows up in the end. So that's why I say that just standing here cuz there's, you know, there's moments I still catch myself like when I look back at it, I couldn't have written that storyline. Mm -mm. It's no. wild. It sounds fake to me when I hear myself say like there's no, no. way you should be standing. I had someone actually ask me like, "Are you okay?" I was like, "Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm here." I'm here, but God brought me through all of it because he has a purpose for me. So whenever I doubt myself, I was like, no, you're here for a reason. Right, right. Incredible, incredible. You're an extremely strong, inspiring person. Uh, you really, you really are. You really are. Um, what was your profession uh, or what is your profession? What industry are you sure. in? So financial advisor. So I'm in finance. I was in banking for several years, seven and a half years uh, with Bank of America. And then I transitioned back in 2014, 2013, 2014 and um, to a local planning firm. And I went independent during the, the pandemic as an independent broker. Yep. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. <laughs> yes, it was good. <laughs> that you shared it was just so wise and on point uh thank you so so much thank you for having me this was great this is a good combo you make it easy to talk to you <laughs> oh thank you so much uh where can people reach you absolutely information? so you can reach me at megan m-e-g-a-n at Megan for Fulton D2.org. So that's M E G A N at M E G A N, the number four, Fulton F U L T O N D2.org is my email address. Um, I welcome anybody who have any questions, happy to answer them. Um, Megan for Fulton.org is also my website. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe to Let's Start Healing. Share at least one episode with someone that you know. And follow me on social media, uh, Let's Start Healing Podcast or Adrian Marie 19 on Instagram. And until next time, let's start healing. <laughs>